for looking about sci-fi. Today we have Auditri Mulik with us. She will she has done her BSc from St. Xavier's College and she is an IPhD student and in the uh, in IACS. She is in the School of Interdisciplinary and Applied Sciences. So Auditri will today talk about mitosis and a model for spindle dynamics in anaphase B. So Auditri, over to you. You may share your screen now. Everyone can see? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so I can start, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Am I uh, like uh, properly audible? Absolutely. Okay. Fine. So um, I'm going to talk about mitosis and a model for spindle dynamics in Anaphase B. And uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, you have heard about mitosis before. And uh, we all have read this in our primary and secondary schools. Okay. But uh, spindle dynamics and Anaphase B, these terms might not be familiar. Also, I use quite a few terms in the abstract that had like uh, flux, depolymerization, polymerization, like uh, physical aspects of microtubules, mitotic motors. So those terms are like very common and uh, frequently used uh, in the context of the problem. Okay, so once I introduce the problem, these terms will become very, very common and uh, they won't be explained at all. Okay, so what I'll do is, I'll explain those terms first and uh, prepare the stage uh, for the introduction of the problem. And after that, we'll get into business. Fine? So I'm starting now. So this is where I start from. This is a broad overview of mitosis. And uh, we all know the stages basically, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. And, uh, but we are really not familiar with anaphase A and anaphase B. So I'll take this opportunity to segregate between the two. So we all have this general idea that uh, during anaphase, what happens, the chromosomes, they segregate, right? So that's what is happening during anaphase B, anaphase A, sorry, the picture to the left, right? Anaphase A. So, uh, wait, where is that, uh, um, that red colored uh, something? I really am not very, uh, familiar with using this. So please can you help me with this red dot? I want that. I think you can move your pointer. We can see your pointer. Okay, so yes, fine, we fine. can see it. Okay. Yeah. So we see that the chromosomes are segregating during anaphase A. So what happens during anaphase B? If this is happening during anaphase A. So what happens during anaphase B is the spindles, these two are the spindle poles, okay. And during anaphase B, these two spindle poles move apart. They are moving apart from each other, thus increasing the pole-pole distance. So the pole-pole distance increases for the first time throughout mitosis during anaphase B. So anaphase B specifically is the stage when spindle elongation takes place. So that's what I meant when I, uh, when I mentioned spindle elongation in my abstract. And also, I'll take this opportunity to introduce you to IPMTs. So what are IPMTs? If you look at this spindle anatomy uh, portion, there are two sorts of microtubules. One microtubule that is in association with the chromosomes. Uh, the X-shaped ones are the chromosomes, right? And so these are KMTs, kinetopor associated microtubules. Okay. And IPMTs are interpolar microtubules. Microtubules which are not in association with the chromosomes, but are interacting with microtubules from the other pole. So this is IPMT, interpolar microtubule. So we need this abbreviation because this is exactly on what the, the idea or the main topic is based. Okay. So I've listed here a few uh, of the like uh, topics that are necessary, let's say to understand the problem, but really not understanding the problem. 
problem. These are uh, necessary for getting into the essence and um, getting motivated towards working this. So there are, I won't go into each one of these because I've got a time constraint. I will just go into two indispensable ones that have marked with double stars, okay? So this is construction of spindle empties. Sorry. Construction of spindle empties. So what are spindle microtubules made of? If you look at the picture to the left, this one, this one, specifically this one, microtubules are nothing but polymers. And so polymers are always made of some repeating unit, right? Which are commonly termed as monomers. But uh, those repeating units need not necessarily be composed of a single element. They can also be composed of two elements, three elements, four elements. So they can be composed of dimers, trimers, tetramers. But in case they are composed of dimers, if the two components are different, then it is a heterodimer. And microtubule polymers are essentially made of heterodimers. And so what is the heterodimer here? The heterodimer is this alpha and beta tubulin. So these are the dimers that are forming the microtubule polymer. And so this is the nucleating site. This is the spindle pole, right? At least the nucleating site of the microtubule. And this is the microtubule, nucleating microtubule, that is polymerizing microtubule. Now, one thing is noted, is notable here, is that this beta tubulin is always polymerizing distal to the pole, always. So therefore, at any instant of time, the free end of the microtubule consists of beta tubulin. Okay, and this beta tubulin has got uh, way more dynamic properties as compared to alpha tubulin. So it is, uh, it is uh, capable of, uh, of rapidly lengthening and shortening. And so, as compared to alpha tubulin, of course, and so these free ends are way more dynamic as compared to these ends, which are in association with the poles. So the more dynamic end of the microtubule will be termed as the plus end. And the one in association with the poles will be termed as the minus end. So this minus end and plus end of microtubules, this part is very important. Next, we go into motor proteins. And uh, this is what I meant by mitotic motors when I mentioned them in my abstract. Okay, so mitotic motors, as the name suggests, or at least you can just, uh, at this point, not essentially mitotic, but any sort of cellular motor is a protein, which is responsible for any sort of mechanical activity at the cellular level. Okay, and so how it does its work, it walks along the microtubules. So as, the, as the picture suggests, these are the motor proteins and they're walking along the length of the microtubule and their functionality is defined by the direction in which they move along these microtubules. So we see that this one moves towards the plus end and this one moves towards the minus end. And so there are two distinct families of motor proteins. One is kinesin, the other one is dinin. Now, one thing I have to say here is that these three families that I have mentioned, uh, kinesin 13, kinesin 5, and kinesin 4, these families of kinesin have got, uh, why are they mentioned with uh, such emphasis? Because the three particular mitotic motors that I mentioned in my abstract belong to these three families, and each family has a specific function. So kinesin 13 essentially is a depolymerase. So this is responsible for depolymerizing the microtubules. Kinesin 5 is responsible for sliding the microtubules. And kinesin 4 is a very versatile family. It does not have uh, a well-defined function. It does a lot of things. Okay. So I'm, I'm mentioning these because uh, these functions will be coming in handy once I introduce them. Next. This is like uh, one of the, let's say, uh, one of the defining uh, characteristics of the problem at hand. This is... Uh, very, very fundamental to microtubules and it's termed as dynamic instability of microtubules. So, uh, what is it? Whenever we think of uh, polymers, we visualize what? We visualize a thread. It's a thread-like structure with a constant length. But these microtubules are essentially two-state polymers. Two-state polymers means they have equally stable two states. Okay. And they switch between these two states at random. So here, as the picture suggests, the two states are the state of growth and the state of shrinkage. So therefore, a microtubule is a polymer that constantly undergoes disassembly and assembly. And it switches between these two states at random, or at say, 
let's say at random rates that are defined by the frequencies of rescue and catastrophe. So what do I mean by rescue and catastrophe? Rescue is the process of the phenomenon of changing from the state of shrinkage to growth. And catastrophe is just the opposite, changing from the state of growth to catastrophe. And so there are four parameters are there, the velocity of growth, the velocity of shrinkage, the frequencies of rescue and catastrophe that define the dynamic instability of microtubules. And so these properties together, these, this quantity is one of the defining quantities uh, for uh, microtubule growth. And if this quantity is less or equals to zero, then the microtubules are in the bounded growth regimen. And if they are greater than zero, then they're in the unbounded microtubule growth regimen. So what do I mean by bounded and unbounded growths? As the uh, simulation suggests, this is length versus time simulation that was done for these values. Okay. And this is a bounded growth of microtubules. So we see that it increases and then decreases at random, right? So therefore, it's constantly undergoing assembly and disassembly, but in time, it's not growing. So bounded growth simply means there's no net growth. It's assembling and disassembling, but there's no net growth. Whereas in unbounded microtubule growth, this is evident that it's growing over time. So it's undergoing disassembly as well as assembly, but it's, it's growing over time. So towards the left, I've got the simulation for just one microtubule, and this is a system of 200 microtubules that is simulated. Okay, and so we see that under the <coughs> unbounded growth regimen, almost if there is a system of microtubules, uh, then all of them will grow over time. Now I introduce you to microtubule flux, and I'm sure I've used this term in the abstract. And uh, this is a very frequently used term in physics as well. So what does it mean in context of this problem? So we'll see at this, this picture. The blue one is a chromosome. Okay, and this has no, no relation to, this picture has no relation to anaphase B. This is just for introducing microtubule flux. Okay, so the blue one is a chromosome. This, this one, this is a chromosome. And these two are microtubules. And this is the spindle pole, right? And so this is, this is the plus end and this is the minus end. And so we see at the plus end, one of the microtubules is polymerizing, the other one is depolymerizing. So why is this happening? This is at random assembly and disassembly, which I just discussed. This is dynamic instability at the plus end. Okay, and in the unbounded regime, they are growing at this point. So there is a net polymerization at this pole. And it, not at this pole, at the plus end. And at the poles, there is depolymerization. So therefore, there is a simultaneous polymerization in this end and depolymerization at this end. As a result of which, this blue mark, which, uh, which signifies a speckle of tubulin dimers, which means a group of tubulin dimers, what it does, it starts moving along the length of the microtubule, even though the length of the microtubule itself remains the same. Fine. So this movement along the microtubule, the rate of this movement is what is flux. So therefore, we see in this picture, all sorts of microtubules exhibit this flux, and this is essentially poleward, because there is polymerization at this end and depolymerization at this end for all of them. So this is what is microtubule flux. This is what I meant by microtubule flux when I mentioned it in my abstract. And so this is also going to play a very, very important role. And uh, I would like to introduce an idea at this point. <clears throat> Think that uh, here, the depolymerization is here, right? And uh, here, the polymerization is here. So if these two were sliding, right? If these two were sliding, then the sliding would be, would be changed into flux in case depolymerization would be here. But if depolymerization would not be here, then the sliding can help in moving this spindle pole farther to the, towards the left, right, right? So therefore, depolymerization and sliding are antagonist to each other, antagonistic to each other. This idea, we will be cultivating this idea throughout this problem. This is, this is very, very central to the problem that I'm going to introduce at this point now. So we are all set. We have set the stage for the introduction of the problem. And so we finally go into it. So I start with the proposal. What is the idea or the hypothesis we are trying to, let's say, establish? So the proposal. These two are the, let's say, this one, this part is a model, qualitative model. model. And this, is one is a, this one is a biochemical model, which features the mitotic models. So we'll discuss this first. <clears throat> There are uh, four times, four instances of time, uh, T1, T2, T3, and T4, and it's the same pair of antiparallel microtubules. Okay, now look at T1, 
and T2, which is happening during metaphase or anaphase A. So during metaphase or anaphase A, the microtubules essentially are isometric. They're all of the same length. Okay, and this same length is maintained by this simultaneous polymerization and depolymerization. Right, so this is evident in this picture. Here is this polymerizing and here it is depolymerizing. As a result of which, this orange speckle of tubulin dimers are able to move along the length of the microtubule. Right, so this is just flux during metaphase or anaphase A. But during anaphase B, what happens is we see that there is no depolymerization of the poles anymore. But there is polymerization at the plus ends. As a result of which, these two are moving apart. And as you see, the speckle is not moving along the microtubule anymore because there is no depolymerization at this end. What is it doing is it is moving at the same rate as the poles are moving apart, right? So this is the main idea. So at this point, I can ask a question that, uh, why is this, uh, like, if the polymerization is there at the plus end, why is it moving apart? Because there is motor here, which is sliding these two away. So what is the motor here? This is the motor. So the motor, which slides, I've already mentioned the family, where the motor slide, the kinesin 5 family. And so this, this motor, the green one, which is below in the biochemical model, the green one is KLP61F, as is in the inset, KLP61F, which is a kinesin 5 family motor. So this is responsible for sliding the microtubules apart. And this sliding is progressively changed into flux, doesn't help in the sliding, uh, doesn't help in spindle elongation during metaphase or anaphase A, because of the deep polymerase at the pole. So what is this? This is a kinesin 13 family motor, which is essentially KLP 10A. This is responsible for deep polymerizing at the poles, right? And this one, which has a question mark over it, is a kinesin 4 family motor. So as I said, kinesin 4 family, uh, 4 family is a very versatile family. It does a lot of things. And we exactly don't know what it does at this point. So this is one of the, one of the tasks that we have at hand to characterize the expression of this motor, KLP3A, which belongs to this family of kinesin 4. So this is the scenario which happens during metaphase or anaphase A. So what happens during anaphase B? We see there is no KLP10 in here. So there is definitely no depolymerization of the poles. But KLP61F is still there. So it's sliding and that sliding is not changing into flux because there is no depolymerization of the poles. And this one, KLP3 is still present with a question mark over it because we don't know what exactly it does. So we hypothesize at this point that KLP3 is responsible for inhibiting the depolymerization of the poles. We exactly don't know how. But we hypothesize the presence of KLP3A is responsible for inhibiting depolymerization of the poles. And so what it does is it plays a role in coupling the sliding of the microtubules to spindle elongation. Okay, so this is the main idea, central idea. And let's say the central problem, which I try to express in my abstract. Now the materials used that were used for uh, like, say testing this hypothesis, Drosophila umbrellas. So we see they express GFP tubulin. Here I've written GFP tubulin. What is GFP? GFP is green fluorescent protein. So we, we really have a lot of things to do experimentally with fluorescence. And these tubulin dimers, which are forming the microtubules, they essentially are exhibiting green fluorescence because of this protein, which is binding to them. And so we have got four samples here. So in this sort of uh, experiments where uh, we try to characterize the expression of a particular motor, okay, as we are trying to do it here for klp 3 we always use two samples, two, two kinds of samples. One sample where klp 3 freely expresses itself. And the other sample by KLP3A, uh, 3A's expression is suppressed, right? So we can see clearly what happens in the presence of it and what happens in the absence of it. So therefore I have here two categories of samples. One is the control where KLP3 expresses itself fully. The other two are samples where KLP3 is inhibited. Okay, and the experimental techniques for this one, of course it will revolve a lot around spectroscopy because there is fluorescence involved. So these two are there, but I won't explain these two. FSM and FRAP, I won't explain these two at this point, because once I go into the results, these will become obvious. Now one chymograph is there, which is essentially computational in nature. And so this is responsible for 3D reconstructions. We'll see a few of these 3D reconstructions later in the results section. And uh, 
the mathematical model, which uh, we'll later develop for this system, that will be reproducing the results numerically using random numbers. So these are the experimental techniques that were used. <clears throat> so these results are essentially experimental at this point. Okay. So we have two sets of data, pre-NFSB and NFSB. Now in pre-NFSB, we saw that there is depolymerization of the poles and polymerization of the plasmids. And what does it show? It shows the rate of poleward flux, right? So the rate of poleward flux sustains itself. The poleward flux sustains itself during metaphase or anaphase B, right? And so the presence of KLP3A in the control or the absence of it in the uh, inhibited samples really does not make much difference because we see that the rates of poleward flux are really comparable during pre anaphase B. So this is what is shown here in this table. These are the values of rate of poleward flux in all the four samples, and we see all of them are pretty comparable, right? So it really doesn't play a role during pre B. So during pre B, there is no spinal elongation, and so klp really doesn't play a role there. What happens during anaphase B? This is the data for the inhibited samples, and so the mean is around this value, which is way higher as compared to the mean for the controls, right? So therefore, in the controls where klp is expressing itself, the rate of poleward flux is way lower as compared to the rate of poleward flux in samples where KLP3 has been inhibited. So this is what we see here as well. This is anaphase B forward flux, and these two are the values, 0 0.008 and 0 0.014. These two are the values for the controls, whereas these two are the values for the places where they have been inhibited. So therefore, from here we can, we can let's say, concretely conclude at this point, experimentally, at least this is proved, that KLP3A is responsible for suppressing forward flux. Why not? completely inhibiting depolymerization because poleward flux really doesn't go to zero. It gets suppressed. So therefore, it suppresses uh, poleward flux and so it suppresses depolymerization. This is something which is proved from this point. At this point, this is something very concretely which can be conclude, concluded. This is uh, the rate of poleward flux during anaphase B versus the rate of anaphase B. So there are four families of points according to the inset, right? And so these families of points, they have higher rates of polar flux and that correlates to a lower rate of anaphase B. So rate of anaphase B, by this I mean rate of spindle elongation. And so of course rate of spindle elongation will be lower when the rate of polar flux is higher, right? So therefore these two quantities are inversely related. But what is striking in this point is the relation is essentially linear in character. So this will be investigated further. Uh, we'll see if this can be numerically reproduced, okay. So despite what one thing we are getting here is, despite the very dynamic nature, as I discussed with respect to the dynamic instability of microtubules at the plasmids, despite this very dynamic nature of microtubules, the elongation is pretty linear in character. Okay, so this is something which is, uh, let's say, a characteristic of biophysical studies where most of the parameters are really non-linear, okay, but the results are fairly linear. Okay, this is pole-pole separation versus time. Okay, and uh, as, as uh, I mentioned before, during metaphase or anaphase A, there is no pole-pole separation uh, increment. Okay, that is the reason why almost this distance remains the same, but this distance steadily increases and it's again linear in character, and it does for approximately 50 seconds. So therefore, anaphase B, we get a time scale from here of anaphase B, which occurs almost around 50 seconds, approximately for 50 seconds. And this is again linear in character as we see. Now this is FSM result, and I did not explain what FSM was. So this will be more obvious once I explain this, this picture. So this is a black and white picture. This is captured in time. Okay. So this, this white beads, as you see, if this would be colored, then this would be green in color. And so what are these? These are tubulin dimers. And so these are microtubules. These are the spindle poles. And these are fluorescence exhibited by the GFP protein, which is binding to the tubulin dimers. Right? So if this would be a video, then we will see that these speckles are steadily moving away from the equator towards the poles. And this is exactly what FSM does, because FSM stands for fluorescent speckle microscopy. And so this helps in uh, observing the rates of poleward flux, rates of poleward flux during anaphase B, anaphase A, during any, any sort of stages of mitosis. And this is what? This is chymographic reconstruction, and this is essentially computational in nature. So we will see what, what is the takeaway, main takeaway from this picture 
is this one. What is this? This is a transverse section of this. Okay, and it reveals, this is one cartoon for this one to make it more clear. It reveals bundles of IPMTs instead of single IPMTs. So previously when I, uh, when I introduced you people to IPMTs, I said key single microtubules, right? I, at least the picture showed single microtubules, but actually in reality, they do not interact singly, they interact in bundles. And so bundles of IPMTs are formed. So approximately in Drosophila embryos, we found that around 19 IPMT bundles are there. Okay. Next is FRAP resins. And I again did not explain what FRAP was. So this will again become apparent just like FSM did in this picture. So what is this? This is again that same fluorescence of the spindle landscape, right? And these two are the poles and these are the microtubules in association with it. And so at this point, we see this is the spindle interzone. This is exactly at the center. Okay. And this is almost around two micrometers in length, this one, this area. Now, this area has lost the fluorescence, which was here. So what is this? This is termed as photo bleaching. So the process of photo bleaching does what? It damages the fluorescence of a particular area. And what happens progressively in time is that this, this area again regains the fluorescence back. So what is happening here? What is express, expressing the fluorescence? JFP proteins, but they're in association with tubulin dimers, right? So therefore, this area, in this area, there's an active diffusion of uh, tubulin dimers, and that is raising the concentration of tubulin dimers around the plus of the IPMTs, leading to a net polymerization of the plus So this is what is termed as FRUP result, because FRAP is nothing but fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching, and this is exactly what it does. And this is what, this is intensity of fluorescence versus time, and this simply shows the recovery of this fluorescence versus time. This is just the recovery in terms of its intensity versus time. So now we are done with the experimental results, and uh, we now introduce the mathematic, mathematical model, which uh, essentially models this phenomena during anaphase B. So before I, let's, let's say, head into head straight into the models, I would first discuss the assumptions. So these assumptions will become very clear once I refer to one of these pictures. So from this picture, it's pretty clear by now what is what. Uh, these are the poles, okay? And these threads are essentially microtubules. These are its plus ends. These are its minus ends, right? Okay, and they are overlapping each other. So these are essentially only IPMTs. We are not considering KMTs here. Okay, so the first assumption is all the MTs are of the same length. So this is, again, a very simplified model. So it will um, have these oversimplifications at some points. These microtubules are essentially equal in length, the first point. Second, in case the microtubules, uh, more than one microtubule is emanating from the same pole, which is here, which happens during a uh, real anaphase B, because as I said, they form bundles. Like here, it is a bundle, it's, it forms a bundle, it forms, it forms a pair, okay? And then it interacts with another pair from the other pole. Okay, and so this has parallel MTs. Parallel MTs are MTs from the same pole, uh, interacting as IPMTs. So in case there are parallel MTs, maximum overlap between parallel MTs will be avoided. So this is another assumption. The green ones are essentially KLP61F, which are responsible for sliding the microtubules. And so these motors are uh, sliding motors and they have linear force velocity relation. So this is another assumption where they have linear force velocity relation. relation. I will discuss what it means, but for now they have linear force velocity relation. And the number of microtic motors that are in action between any two microtubules is proportional to its overlap length. Right, so therefore, at this point, we will introduce a quantity which uh, says, which quantifies number of micro uh, number of microtic motors per unit length. Okay, so more the length, more is the number of microtic motors. And another assumption at this point, the last assumption, is that if the force F3, as we can see, if F3 is the force generated across this array, again, is the same for all the others, not that F3 is equal to F2, but F3 is just like mapped into F2. Uh, so what is the assumption is, if F3 is the force across this array, along this array at least, then this is the force generated between this overlap, 
again this is the force generated between this overlap again this is the force generated in this overlap and so f3 is equal to the force generated here equals to here equals to here so this is again an oversimplifying aspect of the model but this is one of the assumptions for the model okay so now i go to the linear force velocity relation and as is evident from the graph this is inverse in character and uh, from the equation which is given in the inset i'll explain the parameters so what is f stall and v max this is with respect to one of the motors right so f stall is the maximum force that any motor in given motor can generate and v max is its maximum unloaded velocity okay and as the inverse character of the relation suggests the maximum velocity condition is attained at zero force and the maximum force condition is attained at zero velocity so now we go into uh, like uh, the force generated by a system a pair of uh, over anti parallel microtubules where there is just one motor in between and the force which it generates is this so i am showing these derivations because these forces will be directly written a few slides later and these forms are really important given that this is the force generated between anti parallel microtubules and this is the force generated between parallel microtubules with v2 and v1 having the same uh, let's say meanings in this picture as it is okay so now i go into this unrealistic spinel model so why is this unrealistic in the first place because i've got single ipmts but ipmts are not single in character they form bundles right so that is the reason why this is unrealistic in character so why are we at all considering this because if we understand this simple model we will understand a more complex one which is more realistic so this is mainly considered for clarity okay so here i introduce two state variables s of t and l of t okay s of t and l of t as it evident are time dependent parameters not parameters but quantities okay and s of t is the time dependent interpolar distance and l of t is the time dependent overlap distance okay now v of sliding is the velocity of sliding of the microtubules and v of depolymerization is the rate of depolymerization of the poles and the rate of polymerization of the plus ends is given by this v plus polymerization okay now the first equation vsdt which means the rate at which the pole pole separation occurs okay now this pole pole separation will be aggregated by the velocity of sliding which is occurring towards the poles right but if there is depolymerization at this poles then most of the sliding will change into flux and not assist in spindle elongation so that explains the first equation with respect to the overlap distance here l of t we see that this l of t increases if we have polymerization at these two poles right and this l of t will decrease because of the velocity of sliding which is towards the poles right so that explains the second equation the third equation is the most significant physically most significant equation here because on the left hand side we have mu times dsdt so i have not defined what mu is mu is the drag coefficient drag coefficient of what drag coefficient of the nucleoplasm that surrounds these sliding motors okay so whenever there is spindle elongation the sliding motors experience a drag force and that is exactly equals to this okay and so they have to keep on working against this force to keep on sliding and uh, assisting in spindle elongation so this is the force which is generated by them so what is this this is the force velocity relation uh, for one motor and this is the overlap length times k k is that quantity which i said number of mitotic motors per unit length so k times l will simply give the number of mitotic motors in action for one overlap and if i have n such arrays i've got two array here two arrays here if i have got n such arrays then multiplying that by n will give me the total force generated by all the sliding motors in action and so this essentially the third equation is essentially a force balance equation so keeping this in mind we move into the realistic spindle so what is the difference with respect to the unrealistic spindle we can have parallel entities so we can have bundles okay not exactly bundles but at least more than one entity interacting with uh, a group of similar entities from the other pole this is one aspect and the second aspect is the overlaps can change so l12 need not be equals to l23 or l34 okay so the first equation again is the same thing as before this has been just explained 
again, L23, as you see, is the overlap between anti-parallel and microtubules, which has again just been explained. But this one, L12, is the overlap between parallel entities, and this has not been explained so far. So I would like to mention at this point because uh, this equation was not in the paper that I'm referring to for this talk. This equation is an original equation. Okay, and so I would explain this part by part. If you look at this, this is the first one, this is the second one, second uh, parallel entity. And if at this point, this is the plus end of the first one, polymerization occurs, then this will increase. So therefore, this is here. Again, if at this point, depolymerization occurs, then again, this will decrease, right? So here, this is so. Again, given the directions of V2 and V1, V2 will increase this overlap, whereas V1 will decrease. Thus, this is explained at this point. And what is this? This is again the force balance equation. But this I, what is the summation over I? I is array, summation over array. So this, for, for this picture at least, is F1 plus F2 plus F3. Okay, so as I said, before I, I discussed these forms, this is for parallel entities, and this is for the anti-parallel entity, and so this is essentially for this one, and these two are for this and this, and so all these three are equal to F3, so this is one of the inherent assumptions for the model. And once I know what F3 looks like, I can also find out what F2 and F1 look like, and once that is done, I can read, I, I, I can completely write this equation. So we again have got four families of equations here, for anti-parallel as well as parallel microtubules and for the spindle elongation and the force balance equation. So this is the realistic spindle model. Okay, so this is a list of model parameters that were used. And at this point, I would like to stress that uh, the last two, Vm and V of depolymerization, as I already expressed what Vm is, this is the maximum unloaded velocity of the sliding motors. <clears throat> These two parameters primarily affect the rate of spindle elongation. All the others, if I change these, then they might not end up affecting it significantly, at least initially, but these will. Okay, and we'll explicitly show how it does. So now the numerical results. The results that this model was able to reproduce. Okay. So this is the experimental data that I've already explained, and this is the one that came from the model. Given there's a difference in the percentage of total count as a result of number of samples that have been tested numerically, there is not much difference in the rate of polymer flux. And so this result, which say that KLP3A's presence really suppresses polymer flux has been reproduced numerically again here successfully. This is again the same thing, the rate of polymer flux during NFS B versus the rate of NFS B. And again, it screams the same information for a higher rate of NFS B, uh, for a lower rate of NFS B, we will have a higher rate of polymer flux and vice versa. Okay, again, it is linear in character we see. This is pole pole distance versus time. Okay, and this has already been discussed before. And this, this reveals what happens in the wild and the inhibited case. This is the wild type, which means the control, where KLP3 is expressing itself, and we again see there's a linear elongation. Whereas there is almost negligible elongation in the samples where KLP3 has been inhibited. So therefore, KLP3A has been strongly established to be able to uh, suppress full pole work plug during NFSB. And so what it does is, there is this two-way thing here. If you look at this one, it suppresses pole work plus, right? Again, if you look at this one, it helps in pole pole distance increment. And so from this, I can say that the pole pole distance increment or let's say spin wheel elongation is correlated to suppression of pole work plus. Okay. This is again the fluorescence recovery and uh, to the right is the numerical uh, data, which uh, has been, which were fed to FRAP data. FRAP data was fed into this. And so this is another numerical uh, reproduction of the same. And it screams again the same thing. There is polymerization at the plus ends of the IPMTs in the spindle in the zone. And so now I discuss the results. Results of this, these were also the results, but one of the main, let's say this result that takes the center stage will be coming now. The results of unrealistic spindle, okay, are being discussed here now. As I uh, discussed the three equations for this model, if you just do a simple algebraic manipulation of the same, uh, you will get this equation for V of sliding. And what is important here is the V of sliding depends upon Vm and V of depolymerization. And it also depends upon this A, 
which was not introduced before. So this is a parameter and it also depends upon L, right? So we know what VM and VD polymerization is. So I'll explain what A is. A is this quantity. So NKFM divided by mu VM. What is this? NKFM. This is the maximum force that can be generated by the sliding motors across all the arrays per unit length. Okay. And in the denominator mu VM, this is the maximum drag force that can be experienced by them, by the sliding motors. And so the ratio of the two basically uh, points at their resistance against the viscous drag that they experience as a result of spindle elongation. And so this is a constant parameter. And according to the values that were given, that are given alongside, these were taken from the model, uh, from the table that I just uh, mentioned. A is approximately nine. 9 per micrometer. I, I've missed the unit here. It's 9 per micrometer. Again, it's 9 per micrometer here. Throughout, it's a constant. But L can change. L can become large and L can also become small. And towards the beginning of anaphase B, L is large. And so the velocity of sliding almost goes to V of M. So this is what, this is a characteristic of the mitotic motor, right? And so V of sliding is almost equal to the maximum unloaded velocity of the motor if L is large. But as L progressively decreases, L is small, the velocity of sliding almost equivalent, is equivalent to the V of sliding, uh, sorry, V of depolymerization. Okay, which is pretty low by the end of anaphase B and the later stages of anaphase B. And so I can safely say that velocity of sliding of the microtubules in the later stages of anaphase B is almost near to zero. It's not zero, but it's very small. And so the mitotic motors are essentially working near their stall force. Okay. Okay. Now we go into this result, which is the, as I said, the result which is supposed to take the center stage here. So this is L versus T, L, S versus T and L versus T. So this is pole pole distance versus time. And this is IPMT overlap versus time. And so this has been plotted for four rates of polymerization here. And as we see for a higher rate of polymerization, the IPMT overlap almost sustains itself. There are small fluctuations nevertheless, but these small fluctuations are because of dynamic instability. These are very inherent to any sort of microtubule. But what is important here is the overlap length sustains itself for a higher polymerization rate. And the overlap length progressively goes to zero if the polymerization rate is lower. Okay. And for lower rates of polymeriz uh, polymerization, we again have the rate of pole-pole separation changing like this. Okay. But it doesn't change till this point, approximately 15 seconds, uh, less than that anyway. But uh, approximately this part, okay, this part of the pole-pole separation really doesn't matter, doesn't uh, depend upon the mean polymerization rate. And so this is because at this point, L is almost significant enough. And so when is L significant enough, as I said, L is large, V of sliding is equal to V of M, which is the maximum velocity uh, of the mitotic motors. And this is, this is a property of the mitotic motor. This doesn't depend on polymerization. And so that is the reason why even for different rates of polymerization, the pole pole separation rate is the same at this point. Once the IPMT overlap lengths become small, so therefore this becomes more and more accurate, let's say, what happens is the velocity of sliding goes down and so does the pole-pole separation rate. So the pole-pole separation rate gets affected drastically as the polymerization rate goes, rates go down because for lower and lower rate of polymerization, the IPMT overlap progressively goes to zero. So once the IPMT overlap is very small, the velocity of sliding is also very small. And so the pole-pole separation rate becomes very small. Okay, it's not exactly zero, but it is something very small. Okay, so these are my reproductions. As I mentioned already that I have uh, reproduced some of the results, but this is far from being complete. Okay, I will discuss them. This is the pole pole separation versus time and it really reproduces whatever I just discussed. It doesn't depend on the rate of polymerization here, but it drastically changes for differing rates of polymerization. So these are the uh, parameters that I used. Okay. And so it again is the same pattern, the same information. But here something really weird occurs. 
what is this? This is overlap length versus time. And we see one of them growing over time. But this is not possible. It cannot grow over time because we explicitly saw L decays. L either sustains itself or decays. Okay, so it really cannot grow. So what is this? This is brom. Why did I include this then? I included this because there is something that we have not taken into account. We have just considered polymerization rate to be a constant. So that is the reason why it grows. We have not taken into account the very crucial dynamic instability of the microtubules. As a result of this, this grows over time. There's a constant polymerization rate, so it grows over time. So this is wrong because we did not take dynamic instability into account. This is again to show the rates of depolymerization, how they affect the rate of pole-pole separation. And as I said, uh, unlike the rates of polymerization, which uh, where the pole-pole separation really is independent of it, for the first around some seconds, around 10 seconds approximately, it's independent. But here it starts affecting right from the beginning. So therefore, the pole-pole separation rate has got a complete dependent dependence on the depolymerization de rate. So therefore, the depolymerization uh, polymerization rate, as I said uh, late, uh, just earlier, as I said, that uh, these two parameters really play a crucial role in pole-pole separation rate. This is evident from these two graphs. Okay. So this is a system for three microtubules. This is a more realistic one than the previous one, and these are the equations. And I've again reproduced their problems, their uh, graphs again. Okay, and so this again shows me the same result. And so polymerization rates are here given. And so it's uh, independent for the first few seconds, and then it starts getting affected. This difference is because of difference in the parameters. Okay that uh, it lasted a few more uh, seconds before, but it is not lasting as many seconds here because of the difference in the parameters. But still, it's the same information here. But here again, I see this is the anti-parallel overlap. Sorry, this is the parallel overlap and this is the anti-parallel overlap. Both of them grow, right? Some of them decay, but most of them grow. So this is an account of dynamic instability, which is so crucial to the problem because this is how the dynamic instability uh, expresses itself for microtubules. So this is IPMT length versus time for the first 50 seconds. Exactly not the first 50 seconds, but particular the 50 seconds where uh, anaphase B occurs. And we see, we know that it has a what, a net growth, right? So it, if I if I consider its net, its uh, polymerization rate to be a constant, then it's supposed to grow, it's supposed to grow throughout, right? But it's disassembling and then assembling. Though its extent of assembly is more than its disassembly, but nevertheless it depolymerizes. So because of this, that this has not been taken into account, I could not reproduce the, pro, the results that I discussed earlier from the paper. At this point, I would, I would take the opportunity of uh, showing you a video. Uh, this one, this is to show how the empty dynamics really work. See, these are the poles, they're moving apart and this L progressively becomes smaller, right? So, sorry. Yeah, I was here. And I just showed how the spindle dynamics will actually look like an animation, a movie to make it even more clear. So I've discussed the numerical results now and the final biochemical model. So here we are, like uh, we are finally at a stage to decide the fate of KLP3A. Okay. And KLP3A has been established to suppress pole work flux. But how exactly it does, we don't know. So what was done? Uh, spindle organization was visualized, was tested, okay, with samples where KLP3 is expressing itself and samples where it isn't. And it was found that samples where KLP3 is expressing itself, there is way more organization in the spindle as compared to samples where it is not expressing itself. And so evidently KLP3 is responsible for organizing the spindle microtubules. And when it does so, it organizes more and more microtubules into IPMTs. It 
helps in the creation of the bundles of IPMTs. Now, at this point, I would like to stress that any sort of microtubule that grows beyond the spindle interzone really doesn't participate in IPMTs. You have to have lesser dynamicity uh, in order to become an IPMT, and that's what exactly what KLP3A does. It increases the effective number of IPMTs, and so it increases the effective number of minus ends of IPMTs at the poles, and there is a there is a constant available uh, active uh, amount of KLP10A, which is the D polymerase, available at the poles. And so by increasing the number of IPMT minus ends at the poles, the effective amount of active KLP10A per IPMT minus end decreases. And so that's what KLP3A does. It decreases this critical ratio, the critical ratio of these two quantities, that is active concentration of KLP10A to effective number of minus ends of IPMTs. And so that's how it decreases the rate of depolymerization during NFSB. And so therefore, we have finally characterized what KLP3A really does. And I'm almost at the end. These are the areas that I'm going to work on in future. And uh, uh, so it's like uh, asters. I haven't discussed what asters are, but asters are microtubules emanating from the poles. But these are microtubules growing away from the spindle zone. Okay. And so, as I said, that L, L, which is the overlap length, that progressively goes down, right? So once it progressively goes down, okay, the velocity of sliding almost is very, very small, almost is zero, okay? And so the spindle elongation rate drastically falls. So at, at one point, the spindle elongation, uh, in order to occur more, in order to aggravate it even more beyond this point, there has to be a supporting mechanism that helps it, and asters play a role in that via the denactin complex. I'm not going into that, but asters do have a secondary role in spindle elongation, and that's what I'm set to work on in the future. Okay, so this is the references, and that's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oriti. Um, before going to the questions, uh, I just want to point out something. We actually could not see your video, so could you please show us again? Okay, okay, I see. Uh, is this part visible? Can you see the VLC media player window? No, I think you have to choose that from, uh, I think you have to share your screen again. I am sharing screen, right? Yeah, but uh, the Microsoft PowerPoint part is only visible. Oh, okay, okay, I get it. Okay. Yeah. Can you see now? Oh, yes, yes. You can see, right? Okay. So, this is the video. I will explain this shortly, don't worry. Okay, so. What is happening here is these are the spindle poles. Okay, these are the spindle poles. And these are the IPMTs. And these are the overlap regions. And we see that progressively this overlap region goes down. It decreases in amount and the whole pole separation increases. So this is just during RFSB uh, when this is the only mechanism helping in spindle elongation. Okay, that's all. Okay, okay, we get it. All right, so does anybody have any question for Auditory? Oh, okay, Doipan and Ognivo has have raised hands. So okay. Doipan, please go ahead. All right, okay. Auditory, am I audible? Yes, you are. are you, could you please share your uh, slides? Yes, I'm doing that. Hmm. Okay, so I had a question. So where you showed the plot of pole pole separation versus time. Could yeah. you go to that plot, please? Experimental or numerical? Uh, whatever. Okay, I can go to Whichever. both. Is this the one? Wait. Pole pole separation versus time? Right, yeah, this one. Right, okay. exactly. Hmm. So uh, I was just wondering at the tail end of it, I see there is a decrease again, right? Yes. So yes. does your model involve that? And just one more thing, could you, uh, you know, explain it since I'm not uh, accustomed with biology so much. So could you explain it in terms of physics? Like, uh, what is happening in terms of energy or something like that? Why? No, I really don't think there is any uh, uh, any angle to that because uh, okay. here it decreases 
why de- oh, okay if it decreases with uh, what does it mean the pole pole yeah, separation right, decreases yeah. what does it mean it simply means that poles are moving towards each other again right right okay okay but it doesn't happen it is happening here because this does not account for the secondary mechanism that i'm going to work on in future i have to okay. augment this model by introducing that secondary mechanism so achha, okay. so it does not involve that that why you see a dip later yes yes all right Hmm. So in principle it should have increased. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. Uh okay, Arith, it was a great talk. So I have a number of questions. Okay. So and a lot of confusions also. So uh, okay. I think I'll go fast by one. So uh you said that where you showed the plot you reproduced that the, the dynamic uh, actually okay okay wait so yeah this, this one. one okay yeah this one this one hmm. so in the next plot as you said that it is wrong so <laughs> and why it is wrong you said that because you uh, don't take into account the dynamic instability right so uh, can you please just uh, i mean repeat i think i missed what is the reason of this dynamic instability the reason for this dynamic instability i did not discuss the reason is essentially chemical in nature you want me to discuss the reason explicitly then i will go to the slide and again discuss maybe shortly yeah okay fine give me a second hmm so you see here uh, okay one second hmm so what is the reason for this dynamic instability is essentially chemical in nature uh this red part is you can see this red part and there is a blue part right okay yeah. and what are they made of they are made of tubulin dimers right now this tubulin dimers are uh binding gtp gtp is something very similar to yeah. atp okay and uh, it basically helps in uh, providing the energy for conformational changes okay yeah. now what is happening is there is a competition between a rate of hydrolysis and the rate of addition what is hydrolysis by the process of hydrolysis gtp turns into gdp yeah gtp is triphosphate guanosine triphosphate gdp is guanosine diphosphate okay and so it's again very similar to atp changing into atp sorry atp changing into adp okay and so when it changes from gtp to gdp this is the red part which is gdp and the blue one is gtp okay when it changes from gtp to gdp this one this gtp variant of tubulin dimers do not want to be in the polymer their stable state is either monomer staying like a let's not say monomer heterodimer or forming small oligomers okay but it polymerizes why why does it polymerize then when it polymerizes there is this blue cap the blue cap essentially means gtp tubulin which is more stable in the form of a polymer okay so whenever the hydrolysis uh dominates over the rate of addition you will have it at some point this blue cap will disappear and whole thing will become red which means whole thing is now composed of gdp and then it disassembles okay if the rate of addition dominates over the rate of hydrolysis this blue cap remains right and this blue cap once it remains it starts growing okay oh this is this is the reason for dynamic instability okay so uh, okay. i but i mean you have mentioned it in your future work but uh, what happens in these sort of systems you often get a chaotic behavior so if you yeah. actually uh, do a stability analysis and then see or try to see then mm-hmm. i think you can get a chaotic behavior here chemical instability of often lead to this chaotic behaviors okay with my supervisor on the basis of this thank you yeah. for the idea thank you for the idea yeah so mm. uh, if anyone has question please go ahead because maybe i'll take uh, a few more time okay does anybody have any more questions goipan your hand is raised so you want to ask him something more no no thanks oh, okay okay then agni bhai i think you can go ahead okay thank you so uh, i'm just uh, i mean clarifying uh, something 
uh, you did this experiment or theorized the model with respect to the drosophila cell right hello yes yes i can hear you okay so mm. uh, uh, i mean would there be any difference if you did it with some kind of plant cell say uh, plant cells okay yeah so the mechanism is a little different in case of plant cells uh, but uh, the spindle elongation basically is the same everywhere exactly. okay it's just same yeah but yeah. Uh, i was just wondering one thing mm -hmm. uh, i mean what actually can you just explain what actually gives these i mean motors the energy mm -hmm. to go on polymerizing okay. polymer i actually don't have the picture or do i have the picture uh it's not here in the in the presentation but i do have a picture like that i think i replaced it anyway so i will just explain it uh where is this where is this this oh motor ko tha wait here okay it does not have the uh, it does not have it in this picture but what happens is it starts walking like this leg actually this picture is also like very primordial i would say what happens is there is atp and adp okay at the two ends and the one which is in contact is uh has changed atp into adp okay and the part which is not in contact actually here it's showing two legs are in contact right but at a time there is just one leg in contact and the other one is in the air okay the one in the air hosts atp and the one which is there in in mane in association with it hosts adp actually that hosts adp because atp has changed into adp and this change has yielded some energy which is going to help uh, the leg which is bef uh, which is behind which is in the air to rotate and come uh, ahead okay and then again change that atp into adp and place itself again on the microtubule while the one which was ahead is now behind that will again be in the air changing adp into atp okay. so it appears is like the protein is walking yeah. yeah which is often seen in every biophysics seminar <laughs> okay so uh, <laughs> i think yeah the question so now the question okay. is that okay uh, so what happens in case of a cancer cell so as far as i know that they uh i mean stop i don't know they stop the process of apoptosis that they don't die okay okay and they go on uh, <coughs> dividing and dividing so then i'll, I'll say what happens in cancer cells yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah there is uh, one particular uh, there are two ways in which it is treated i i really have no uh, scientific knowledge regarding it but i searched it once in uh, google while going through this paper i saw there are two ways of doing it one is by introducing taxol taxol is a sort of drug okay and the other one is by chemotherapy okay how you stop the mitosis at that point so what taxol does is it uh, preserves the mitotic skeleton or let's say the cytoskeleton okay and so it doesn't allow the microtubules to die out because once your uh, mitosis is complete anaphase b is complete after it goes into the process of cytokinesis actually just before it the microtubules vanish actually they don't vanish they disassemble okay but taxol does what it does not let this microtubules disassemble and so it locks it locks the mitosis right there it does not allow interface to occur it does not allow the duplication to occur which will help this this uh, cell which is just being formed to again enter mitosis okay this is one one way of doing it the other one is uh, by chemotherapy where by means of uh, very uh, highly energetic radiations what you do is you you slice the chromatin material okay and so once you slice the chromatin material the chromatid arms are gone you just have the kinetochore and the chromatid arms face this 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 pole ejection force okay which moves away from the pole and so once you have disturbed the chromatin uh, construction of the system you have disturbed the genetic construction of the system the mitosis is let's say stopped the cell dies yeah. basically yeah. okay yeah. so yeah. Uh, actually uh, in the genetic perspective as far as i remember uh, mm. just from the knowledge of class 11 12 mm. and the google search so uh, that is actually uh, there is a stop codon right in normal cells 
but yes. actually chemotherapy does is that uh, to hamper this stop proton so that uh, the i mean the division process actually stops so this is quite interesting in case of cancer cell but what my question was is that uh, i mean between normal cell and cancer cell the mm. mechanism you were talking about or modeling that is mm. the uh, i think the polymerization depolar the depolymerization or the act of the motors so uh, i mean are they the same or different actually uh, i don't really think uh, mitotic motors do play a role this is completely from my intuition i'm saying uh, because what happens during cancer uh, malignant especially uh, the cells they uncontrollably uh, divide okay and so this this pathway the change in this pathway from normal to abnormal mitosis has something to do with uh, has something to do with signals that it receives via the rna okay there is uh, no no role of mitotic motors at this point i really don't think it is there okay okay mm. okay yeah. mm. so and the last question or rather comment i would say okay. and that is uh, i heard a very interesting talk on this spindle elongation thing and they mm -hmm. actually approach it uh, through uh, from the angle of statistical physics so what they do is essentially treat this spindle elongation and then again separation fr uh, the chromosome uh, from the chromosomes that happens in the later stage of anaphase i think so mm -hmm. uh, they actually model this with the help of an oscillator so they basically treat the spindle as mm -hmm. things like oh, that okay and and what i am thinking to work on uh, in future in near future is that to treat it as a damped oscillator because there is a viscous drag as you said in okay. the talk you mentioned once in the talk mm -hmm. so that also can be a uh, i think can be a potential good project that uh, treating those spindle fibers as oscillators and mm -hmm. then i doing a stability analysis of them and seeing that what uh, results they actually i mean what can we derive from them and then maybe compare with your results because uh, okay. you do it from a different perspective yeah yeah and maybe those uh, as you mentioned the dynamic instabilities and mm -hmm. so on maybe they can match and okay. that would be wonderful so you can okay. actually look up on it i i'm not sure exactly what mm -hmm. he does now uh, mm -hmm. i think it was by shubhadeep ghosh he actually uh was in a conference in our stat physics school held in presidency okay okay so okay was doctor of physics on this so you can search okay, actually okay. on our site okay okay chudi bhosh right yeah i think so okay. uh, if i get it i can send it to you via email perfect yeah yeah so so thank you uh, it was a very interesting experience Okay. Does anybody have any more questions? I don't see anything. Okay. If not, let's thank Ori three. This was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. And um, this, yeah, this marks uh, end to this meeting.